you can't forget the cats. I actually was interviewed for an article one time and they featured my hedgehog uh, in the story. I thought that was pretty funny. His name was Hedge Fund though, which made me laugh any time I talked with investors and they started talking about their hedge funds and I would like kind of giggle about this hedgehog I had at home. Anyway. Cool, I'm so excited to be here with you today and I wanted to thank my boyfriend Gary for helping me get the slides ready. Um, we are in Hawaii because he's a big fan of the, the TV show Hawaii Five O. So we came out here for vacation last year, and now we're here. So um, this is me towards the beginning of my career with a longboard skateboard that I received as a graduation present from uh, a mentor at BYU-Idaho in 2004 when I graduated. So 15 years ago, someone gave me a longboard. Last year when we were here on vacation, I saw all these beautiful longboards lined up outside the business school here. Um, and so I knew it was the right place for me, and this last picture is me when we got here this year, and I'm here. I feel like I found my people. Um, if you guys like longboarding, let's, uh, let's do it. Um, and in terms of this being a lecture series, I love it. It kind of comes full circle for me. I was in the BYU uh, Entrepreneurship Lecture Series for Women at BYU Provo in fall of 2006. And that's really what inspired me to get involved in entrepreneurship. I had done a bachelor's in modern dance and violin, and unfortunately YouTube wasn't around, so I couldn't become Lindsey Sterling at that time. Um, so I kind of missed the market there. Um, and then I realized no one wanted to hire a Russian-speaking modern dancing violinist. So I kind of floated for a little while, and I found myself in this entrepreneurship class at BYU. Loved it. but. Um, I'd hear these stories, these amazing entrepreneurs. I remember this one woman came in and she told us that she was making a million dollars a year shipping welcome mats from her garage. And I was like, that's a stupid business, but she's making a crazy amount of money on it. Like, what am I doing? Um, and this other woman came in, she had this warehouse in uh, Utah Valley um, that just sold Halloween costumes. And she only like operated like three months a year and she was making over a million dollars. And I was just like, what is going on? Like, I have to figure out what I could do. So I ended up um, partway through the lecture series starting this kiosk at Provo Town Center, which is a mall just south of Provo. Um, and I had no money as a college student, so I decided I would like brand it as the $100 business. So I couldn't start, I couldn't use more than $100 to get it started, and I had to make at least $100 within the month to keep it going or to kind of show that I learned something. So um, Anyways, as it turned out, you know, that lecture series was like a graded class and I stopped doing homework because I was focused on my business. So I ended up failing the entrepreneurship lecture series at BYU. Um, as you can tell by that 0.0, .0 GPA right there in the middle, um, which at the time I felt like wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but it was kind of difficult to explain to the MBA committee when I applied for a school uh, in Provo later, 10 years later, when I tried to get in the MBA program. And they were like, could you tell us about that 0.0, .0 GPA that you have in uh, entrepreneurship? Like, what's, and I was like, well, I started a business. And they said, how did it go? And I said, well, um, we made $10,000 that first month uh, while I was, you know, doing that. And they were like, okay, we'll let you in. It's fine. <laughs> so anyways. So that's, that's where I got my illustrious start for all these like wonderful opportunities that I've had, uh, really the same place that you're at today. And so I'm really excited about the opportunity to speak with you and share some of my experiences for good and for bad. Um, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard about business. It was a quote from the CEO of Coca-Cola. He went in to talk to his employees and they were expecting like an hour long lecture. And um, he ended up talking for 30 seconds. He gave this quote and then he left. And he's like, that's it. So basically he said, you know, in life there's five key priorities and four of them are so important that if you drop one of them, um, it can cause irreparable damage. And those things are your family, your health, your spiritual development, your friendships. You know, you could substitute a couple of those if you want to, but it's really that cluster of things. And he said, and one of those things is urgent and it's necessary, but it's not um, at the same level of value and importance. And if you drop that, it can bounce back and that's work. And so even though we're so ambitious, we wanna start businesses, we wanna be successful, that's fine. But just keep in mind that that one area of your life is the most resilient and can really weather the most amount of neglect compared to these other things, your health, your family, your spiritual development, and that's something that I really hope to impress on your minds today in my comments. 
I've had some wonderful experiences in two areas of my career, one in business and investing, startups, venture capital, seed funds, entrepreneurship, technology, really, really, really cool experiences on that side. And I've also had some experiences on the humanitarian, social work, social venture side. So I'm gonna focus on business first and then we'll come to social ventures um, next. So um, throughout these experiences, um, you know, you work with different CEOs, you work with different investment teams, you work with different startups, and especially in entrepreneurship, you see a lot of things coming and going. The shelf life of a startup is really like six months, right, um, for viability. Most startups aren't going to last past that point. So when you've been in this space as long as I have for 15 years, like you see a lot of cycles. and. Um, what I can tell you is that it really comes down to just a core set of things that you have to ensure are going well in the business. Um, so the first thing is revenue. I don't know why this is such a difficult thing to grasp as an entrepreneur personally or as a CEO, but the fact of the matter is that if you don't have money coming in, you don't have a business. I like to tell people a lot of times, like startups, like you're not a not quite for profit organization. <laughs> You're a for-profit business, so that revenue always has to be the number one driver um, that you can find a customer, that you can secure you know, a sale, et cetera. And it can be really, really tempting and easy to follow the vision, follow the product ideation, follow the culture of entrepreneurship. But at the end of the day, what will keep you in business is having a customer that's willing to pay you and that you're able to offer them something of value. And I just want to share a couple like anecdotes. I, I was working with this team in like 2012. They had this really super cool app um, where you could kind of, you could spin around and see like a still frame photo in three, uh, 360 view. It's really, really cool technology, really previous to, um, to AR technology at that time. And I remember meeting with them before they launched it. And I asked them the revenue question, like, how, what's your revenue model? Like, how are you gonna make money on this? All these principles that I've been taught from sitting on the investor side of the table with the venture firms that I worked with. And they said, well, we're just gonna launch it and like, it's gonna be free. And, and I was like, okay, like, and then you're gonna start to charge for it? Or, and then you're gonna have like a premium version? Or, and then you're gonna sell it to like, I don't know, we're, you know, whatever. And they're like, no, 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 it's always gonna be free. And I'm like, this is a big red flag to me. Like, I don't see any money coming in here ever, uh, anywhere. And, um, and they're like, no, no, it's gonna be fine. And I was like, okay, cool. So they were going to South by Southwest, which is like a huge technology festival in Austin, Texas. And I happened to be going to it as well. And I saw them a few days after they launched and I said, how's it going? And they're like, awesome, we have 100,000 users, which is pretty amazing to get 100,000 users in like three days after your launch. It's pretty impressive. And I was like, and how are those revenues going? And they're like, zero. And I was like, man, if you'd only put 99 cents on that app in the app store, you would have $100,000 right now. And that would be amazing. And they're like, yeah, but we just think it still should be free. And I'm like, good luck, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> So months went by, I saw them about six months later, which is, as I said, kind of the shelf life of a startup. And I ran into the CEO and I was like, how's it going? You know, like, how's your user base? How are your revenues? And he's like, so awesome. We have 600,000 users now. And I'm like, so great. Like, who, who, gets a, who gets a half a million users? Like, that's a, really impressive. And he's like, yeah, but like, the bummer is that like my co-founder, our technologist, like our developer that like made the app, just quit um, because his wife told him he has to get a job <laughs> because he can't afford to pay for like the household. And I was like, man, I bet you wish you put 99 cents on that app now, don't you? <laughs> and, I, and I don't say that to be like judgmental or rude. I just think like sometimes as entrepreneurs, we can kind of get divorced from the reality that we're doing this to make money. And that's a priority. Um, there was another startup that I'd seen that had a million users and no revenue. Um, so it's just like, you know, I, I see these things going on separate train tracks. So just keep, keep the revenue and the product on the same train track and keep them moving forward together. Um, one of my good friends, an angel investor in Portland, um, and a, he was on my board for a while of my company, said that uh, sales solves all problems. So you could take that to the bank. 
If you're having a problem in your business, whatever the problem is, go make some sales. That money that you generate from the sales will solve any problem that you're experiencing, okay? Um, in terms of product, oh, the things I've seen with products over the years. Um, a few notable things. One, there's a super awesome company that I was advising um, over the last kind of five years, and they ended up, um, someone on their production team decided to order, oh, yeah, why is that not working? We'll let the expert, sure. Cool. While he's fixing that, I'll let you know. So um, someone on the production team decided that they would order in like three quarters of a million dollars of uh, pants. That was one of their products. One of their products. They also sold robes, t-shirts, tank tops, shorts, like pajamas. They had a lot of products besides just that one like style of pants. And for some reason, like the finance and the product got on separate train tracks, right? So the accounting team and the CFO weren't that involved in this decision to order all this inventory. And you might think that three quarters of a million dollars sounds like a lot of pants. It is a lot of pants. I went in the warehouse and it was a lot of boxes of pants. And I was brought in to help with sales and I was just like, wow, that's a lot of pants we're gonna have to sell. And the problem is when you look at the ratio of pants to total resources. So the company was only doing, it's still, it's pretty. It was. Um, <laughs> There we go, okay. So this, the company was only doing, you know, maybe three or four, four million dollars a year at that time and their revenues had actually gone down. So they had a huge product problem. And, you know, the sales team can like bust their tails like trying to get that product sold but at the end of the day, that product wasn't moving. And for some reason they just kept glomming on like we gotta get these pants out there. We gotta sell cut the price of these pants. Like everything was so focused on the pants and I thought like, we just need to get rid of those pants. Like we just need to get that inventory out of here so we can you know, open up some other kind of opportunity. Um, and a similar anecdote, um, there was this really, really wonderful graphic designer entrepreneur that I was working with and he had made this like really super cute animation and like turned it into like 3D um, stuffed animals. There was like three in the series and they were so beautiful and so cute, and he got someone to give him $100,000 to invest in his company, and for some reason, he decided to put all of the $100,000 into producing 30,000 of these stuffed animals. So then he ends up with a warehouse full of 30,000 very adorable stuffed animals and zero customers. And that was a very, very painful problem for him to have because you can't give away 30,000 stuffed animals. Like he tried, like he couldn't sell them. Nobody really wanted to buy them. He couldn't give them away. He's getting a lot of pressure from his investors. Like it's, it's kind of, um, so anyways, just again, keep in mind, like keep the revenue and the product working together. So before you invest in manufacturing or in uh, inventory, figure out, do I have a distribution channel? And do I have enough customers that justify the level of money I'm gonna put into this inventory and make sure that those things are working hand in hand. Team, always, always take care of your team. Um, whether, whether you're the junior employee, whether you're the CEO, you know, or somewhere in between, take care of your people. What I know is this, is that business, your business, whatever business you're working on right now, whatever company you're involved in right now, it, it is gonna go out of business. It, you know, it could be this year, it could be 40 years from now, but it will go out of business. These businesses are temporary entities that help us do economic activities here on the earth, right? Um, that business is not more important than the humans that are in that business, that are working for you and working with you. Um, and I've seen startups, I've seen business teams implode very quickly within like a week, a month, where you lose the CFO, the operations director, the primary salesperson, five other people, because the CEO wasn't treating them in a correct manner, was putting pressure on them that was inappropriate, was forgetting that they're humans, they need to sleep, they need to take care of their families, they need to be managed in a respectful and appropriate way. So always, always take care of your team, make it a priority. Um, 
Okay, and then the thing I'll say about resources, there's really only three ways to operate a company financially. You can be short a dollar, you can have nothing, or you can have a dollar. That's, that's the core of it. And I will tell you that it always feels better to have a dollar than to be short a dollar. It, it just always does. So you could take that pattern and you could magnify it by the scale of the company that you're at. So again, same principle. You could have 50,000 in the bank, you could have nothing, or you could be short 50,000. And it's always going to feel better to have 50,000 in the bank. And it always feels better to have nothing than to be short 50,000. So be smart about the way that you're designing the finances within the startup that you're working at. It, and, and it doesn't matter if you're at this like dollar, zero, one dollar level, or if you're at the 50,000 or five million dollar level. Um, and the other thing I would say is that all financial problems, no matter how big the hole is that you've found yourself in, and you will find yourself in a hole at some point, personally, in your household, in your family, in your business, it will happen. Um, that hole can be climbed out of. There are solutions for every financial problem. So never let financial stress or anxiety put you into a dark place, mentally, spiritually, or personally, because those are solvable problems. So those are some business lessons for you. Um, in terms of venture capital, oh, these links um, have more stuff about business. The Five Minutes has a podcast series and articles that you can look at from my company, and then the Milestones one is like, um, I had this group of founders that came in and they would like talk about how they got their business cards printed and their goal was to make a million dollars of revenue. And I was like, how far are you from that goal by printing business cards? <laughs> That's like, did you talk to any customers? Did you get any contracts signed this week? Did you like, you know, like what have you done significantly to try to get to that revenue level? So on the milestones link, you can find what I call like 10X approved uh, business goals. So things that are gonna significantly move you towards um, achieving your goals for developing the startup. Okay, in terms of venture capital, these are some rules of thumb. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just to like kind of lay out the landscape a little bit. Venture capital is, um, as Rob said, it's a very competitive style of capital. Um, there's a lot of different ways to fund your business. You can get a loan, you can crowdfund, you can get an SBA loan, you can put your own credit cards on the line, you could sell your house, you can work a job and use you know, the extra money. There's a lot of ways. Venture capital is a specific style of investing that targets startups that have a high growth potential. So the way that I explain it to entrepreneurs is most VCs don't start looking at founders for investment potential until they've cleared $300,000 in previous revenue. Most VCs. Some VCs will look, but most VCs won't do anything. And really, they're not going to get serious about investing in your startup until you've shown an increase in capacity from 300000 a year towards a million a year in revenue. So that means getting from 30000 a month in sales to 50000 a month in sales to 75000 a month in sales within a short period of time, like six months, 12 months at the max. Um, so venture capital isn't for everybody. In fact, it's not for most people. Only 2% of new startups will be funded through venture capital. And of the 2% that are funded, only 4% of that 2% will be uh, female entrepreneurs, which is a real, real problem. And it's starting to change in the industry. There's a lot of women uh, business women, women angel investors, and women uh, venture capital professionals that are now starting funds specifically for women, which is awesome. Um, the statistics for venture-backed companies aren't that much better. I think for any startup, it's like 90% of you will be out of business within a year. 90%. So that means you guys won't be here next year, and maybe some of you guys will be, right? So in venture, it's not that much different. Of that 2%, right, 2% of 100% of the startups that go after venture funding, half of them won't make it six or 12 months from now either. Okay, so the returns um, aren't that much better for, for venture back uh, companies. When I worked at venture funds and in my association with venture capitalists, angel investors, CEOs that have taken angel and venture funding over the years, there is a very prominent culture within this industry that's pretty toxic. Um, and I just put that out there because we're church members. Um, we have 
a different perspective and culture of our own that's more values oriented. And I just would put that out there that um, be careful, um, be careful, be careful. Um, and then uh, just kind of a, like a trivia, for every dollar that you take of a venture investment, let's say you take a million dollars, the venture capital firm wants a minimum of $30 million back from you. So there's a lot cheaper ways to fund your company. Like let's say you take an SBA loan that has a 5% loan interest rate, right? That's 25, seven, eight million dollars more that you could have in your bank account than giving it to an investment fund. Now, can the SBA get your company to 100 million in revenue like a venture capital firm can? Maybe, maybe not. But just saying that there are a lot of other cheaper forms of capital for the same amount of money that might be able to help you reach your goals that don't require the use of, of VC funds. Okay, switching from business and investing now into my work in humanitarian and social. Um, about six years ago, I launched an impact investing initiative um, through my accelerator 10X and started working with um, really, really cool collaborative initiatives and ended up about four years ago focusing in East Africa. Um, it just sort of worked out that way. I never thought I'd work in Africa. I never had ambitions towards that. It's just kind of how life shook out. I had a lot of great experiences. Um, I started a couple of firms myself. Um, Social Venture Society was a think tank for social impact. And then I tried to start a venture firm specifically for international humanitarian called Northwest Social Venture Fund. I ran that for three or four years. It didn't exactly go the way that I hoped it would go, but it was a great experience to try it. Um, I had some great opportunities working with Mercy Corps, which has $400 million a year to do humanitarian initiatives in 45 countries and a team of about 4,000 field employees. So I got to do some work with them in, with their Gaza team, Indonesia, um, Kenya, and um, that was a great experience. And then my career actually, remember I told you I was this um, like unemployable Russian speaking modern dancing violinist? Well, I didn't start my career in business. I actually started my career in social work. Um, because that was the only job that I could find at the time, and I ended up working um, for a couple of social work agencies. And that really turned out to be the best thing ever for the career that I'm in now, because it gave me this perspective on humanitarian issues at a really deep level. Like when you're working hand in hand with a teen mother or a foster child, or some of the clients that I had were juvenile sex offenders, they were really populations that I didn't have experience with and that really challenged my assumptions about the value of humans, no matter what situation they're in, no matter what behaviors they have, no matter what crimes they've committed, it really opened up my heart and made me really interested for the long haul on putting myself in a position professionally that I could impact people's lives in a significant way. So as a humanitarian, uh, just some like kind of things that I've learned, um, and I'm a little kind of jaded as the right, I'm wiser. I'm wiser now, you know, five years after my first international trip. Going on an international trip, going somewhere cool and exotic, Africa, you know, Asia, wherever you're going, is not the same as doing meaningful work. And I had a call with the director of LDS Charities, not Sister Yu Banks, it was the director before her. Um, I had a call with him and we were talking about an international project and he said, essentially, like, what are you doing in your local community? And the tone of voice and the implication was, if you're not doing something in your local community, we don't want to work with you on an international level. And I thought, that's the right one, right? Because what am I doing? Like putting Facebook photos of myself out there going to Africa and I'm like neglecting people in my neighborhood. Which I'm not, I'm just saying like, that's exactly the right attitude to have with humanitarian work is that, you know, um, there's a, there's a meaningfulness to improving anybody's life that can be done at home, it can be done in your family, it can be done in your neighborhood. Um, start there and add to it. Increase your capacity um, from a local level to a regional level to a national level to an international level. Um, and um, yeah, a uh, couple other things. Um, just like a, a on a practical level, I think I, like my first trip to Africa in 2014, I had never traveled at that level before and 
I was just like obsessed with like terrorists and like malaria and all these things. And I just like had so many fears and like misconceptions about local conditions. I really didn't understand, you know, what I was getting myself into. And I got there and it was like completely fine, super safe. Now, I'm not saying that's everyone's experience, that just is my experience. And I was like, oh, you know, and then I think I was like a little bit too aggressive. I was like, oh, no problem. There's no problems over here. And so, but then I was like, oh, it is a third world country, right? Like like Kenya is actually like pretty unsafe in a variety of ways. And so like I got over there, I went, I was there for six months living there and I ended up with like salmonella for a month and like lost 15 pounds in two weeks. <laughs> like, you know, there's just, there's a lot of annoying logistics when you're doing international humanitarian work. Um, and you have to kind of have a practical approach to it. Um, you need to be safe. You need to take care of yourself. You need to not put yourself in a position that you're gonna unnecessarily put yourself, your organization, your family, your longevity as a humanitarian at risk. Um, sometimes things fall apart. I initially went to Africa to work on a specific initiative that I was super excited about and I got there and within two weeks the project was completely canceled and all my stuff in, in the US was in storage, my cat was in a different state living with a friend, like I didn't have housing, I actually had lost my housing in Africa so I kind of took two maybe three weeks and just like watched a lot of TV and felt sorry for myself. And then I started going around and looking at other things I could do to replace that project. So I went to the slum areas in Nairobi. I went and visited the United Nations headquarters. You know, I just kind of, I made myself available to see what, what, what could be done next. I thought, you know, I'm here and they're here. So what, el what else is an option? And it's tough. It's tough to be a social entrepreneur. It's tough to be a humanitarian. It's tough to be a social worker. I'll tell you this. Fatigue is part of the profession. Um, and as such, being proactive to protect yourself against burnout and fatigue and stress is so important because there's a lot of good entrepreneurs, good projects, good humanitarian initiatives that come short or that collapse and implode because not because it's not viable, not because there's not financing, not because it's not a good product or a good idea, but because the entrepreneur is exhausted. I've seen it time and time again. And even if it's not you personally, it might be someone on your team. Um, and even if it's not you personally, it might be your spouse. It might be your family that you're running into the ground through not properly, you know, caring for your responsibilities and ensuring that fatigue from humanitarian, fatigue from achievement, fatigue from the long hours of business, it doesn't creep in and create some, um, some imbalance and some challenges. Um, this is my family. Um, I'm the oldest of 10 kids. I'm the big boss. That's where I got all my executive leadership skills from, from an early age. I remember when I was nine, I was in Girl Scouts and I'm an introvert. Um, which might be surprising, but I really don't like big crowds and I really don't like having to deal with social groups. So I thought, how could I win the prize for selling the most amount of cookies in my group while doing no work personally? Um, and then I thought of my siblings. So I sent them around the neighborhood and they sold all the cookies for me and I won all the prizes. It was awesome. And uh, that's just, you know, part of being a big sister, but my family is one of those glass balls that I refuse to neglect or drop in the process of all the things that I do professionally. Anybody that knows me knows that the core reason that I chose to work for myself um, early in my career is so that I would have the flexibility and the availability to take a few weeks off anytime I need to, to go down and be with my siblings whenever there's a need for something that they have in their life. Um, so here's some of my principles of being a great family member. My role in a family at this time of my life is as primarily as a big sister and an auntie, so it's gonna come from that perspective. If you're a spouse, if you're a son or daughter, if you're a cousin, whatever your family role is, may these principles bless you and improve your family relationships. Um, I, for me, quality time is important, checking in regularly. I'm there uh, for the big things, I'm there for the small things. Um, I send care packages, you know, emails, texts, whatever. Um, Everyone, think about this, everyone would love to have an amazing brother or an amazing sister. If you don't have that, or everyone would love to have an amazing parent or an amazing spouse. If you don't have that, be that, okay? Take it upon yourself, that is my role, okay? I can be that amazing family member. 
For myself, um, I'm in a unique position where I had the opportunity to raise my siblings because of our family dynamics. So I always look for teaching opportunities. I never want my siblings to be um, stuck in their life. I want them to have the skills. So um, I'm kind of known as that annoying person in the family. So it's like, let's plant something. Let's, uh, let's talk about food storage. Let's, um, let's talk about budgets. You know, and I'm sure it's super fun for them, but it gives me comfort and peace of mind knowing that I'm doing everything that I can to enrich my family with skills that strengthen and cultivate them in their lives. Um, if you don't have siblings, that doesn't mean you can't be a sibling to someone else. I had wonderful experiences with an organization called Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, which I love to death. There's also obviously opportunities within the church. Um, and even if your siblings are grown, you know, we're adults now, um, find time with them, you know, a FaceTime video, like a text, you know, and um, I think the biggest investment that I ever made in my life was stepping up to that responsibility as a sibling. And I have nine wonderful humans that I've contributed to their development and it's a blessing. Now, it wasn't a blessing at the time that I stepped into that role, it's a blessing now that has a much bigger ROI than any investment, any business deal, any project, and any humanitarian thing I will ever do. And this is partly why. They have given me these awesome, super fun nieces and nephews. This was a couple years ago, so now there's 19. They're super fun, um, and not having children myself, this is an amazing opportunity to spoil other people's kids and turn them loose back on their parents. Um, being the favorite auntie is awesome. Same principles apply. The same thing I did with their parents when they were younger is the same but better thing I do with them now. Field trips, fun things, care packages, dollar store. Oh, we don't have a dollar store here. No, we do. Down in Honolulu, there's a Japanese dollar store called Daiso. It's super cool. Um, you know, same thing, texts. My favorite thing is when my six-year-old nephew texts me these like ridiculous emoji messages that make no sense, but even at his age, he understands that, you know, we have an important relationship. Um, I never try to interfere with my siblings' parenting style. I try to strengthen their skills. And I think that's important when you're a relative to a family member that's managing their own parenting, you know. Um, we can encourage, but let's know our role, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to end my comments, kind of coming back to that first principle that the, the Coca-Cola CEO gave, that there's these important things in life, some of them are like permanently important and some of them are temporarily important. So along that lines, I think in business, investment, you know, finance, humanitarian, like we get a lot of fixation sometimes on success, right? And I think there's so many like trappings of success when we think about it, like the title, the, the, the press piece, the, the money, the social media photos, right? Like these things seem to indicate that, that I am successful or we are successful or that, that person is successful. And I really wanna temper and adjust your thinking about success. Um, my, uh, I've been blessed with great mentors. I'm not gonna go through all these, but I've just always been around wonderful people that had really interesting relationships to money or success. Um, my, I, one of my bishops at BYU-Idaho was Jack Whelan, and I helped edit some of his books that were bestsellers for Deseret Book. And he told me, um, he said, there's always room at the top. Like, a lot of times people think, like, I, I need to apply online, I need to struggle and compete with all these people that are like, maybe they're as good as I am, maybe they're not as good as I am. And he's like, no, you go introduce yourself to the CEO, like, you find a personal opportunity one-on-one -on -one to demonstrate that you're, you're capable of excelling in a way that is very different from other people that are going for the same opportunity that you're going for. Um, and I just have always loved that advice. There's always room at the top. The, 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 the mediocre employees, there's a ton of them. It's too competitive. <laughs> so be an excellent employee, right? The, the investments, I told you, 98% of startups that go after venture capital will not succeed in landing venture capital. So what can you do to differentiate yourself that you're part of that 2%? Right? That you have the habits of diligence and excellence. Your follow-up is better. Your presentation materials are better. Your awareness of the realities of business are more dialed in, right? So set yourself apart. Um, my high school English teacher, I was notorious in high school for being a slacker for a variety of reasons. Um, but I remember I came back to visit her um, after my first semester of college 
and we were chit-chatting and she was like well how's your homework going and how's like all your assignments and I was like well I kind of like blew this thing off and she was like stop being a weenie and I was like whoa <laughs> she's right you know and so there's just been like times in my life where I'm like Carolyn stop stop that um, <clears throat> for me success is about becoming an asset it's not about what I have it's about what I'm capable of and particularly it's about the cluster of character traits that I have that I've developed within myself that allow me to function this year at a broader level than the year I was functioning at last year. Um, some of these, I'm not gonna get in all of them, but diligence, right? Like I have like a stupid level of perseverance. Like it will be stupid for me to continue with something and I will continue doing it. And sometimes that pays off and I'm happy for that. And sometimes it doesn't pay off because it was stupid and I should have given up, right? Um, but having that level of diligence where like you're always willing to take it to the next step just to see if there's still an opportunity there, that's a great characteristic. As an investor, that's a like to die for characteristic in an entrepreneur. As a human, what a fascinating character trait to develop. So I'd encourage you, like get that diligence. Um, I know a lot of times I feel like in success, it's about like being valued, like being on the cover of that magazine, like being, on the C-suite, like whatever, like being the most important person in, in the experience. And I wanna say like, for me, success is about how you value other people, really. Like, I love, I love the stories when I see like the CEO meeting with the janitor, right? Like, if it's authentic, right? I love the stories of like, you know, people that have attained like a level of competency professionally giving back. I remember one of the most compelling quotes that I heard as a student was, I think about uh, one of the philanthropic families in Utah, that they didn't start, uh, let's see, he didn't wait till they were millionaires to start giving charitably. And I'm not talking about tithing, I'm talking about within the community. They started as poor college students giving 10% of their income beyond tithing to charitable oriented things in the community. And that is so impressive to me, that like that demonstration that you can value people around you and you can be contributing to people around you at any level. You don't need to have like a t aspired to this like pinnacle of success and then you start. Um, I feel like the most important thing with being an asset is becoming unrecognizable to yourself this year and to others than you were the year before. Like one thing for me in my life, I had this like paralyzing fear of flying. Like I would not get in an airplane. I think I was 31, yeah. 31 before I was like willing to go on an airplane and um, then within two years I'd flown oh and that was after a year and a half of therapy and deep personal work to get over that it wasn't just like light switch flipping on and off within two years I'd flown to like 25 states in the US and then after that I'd flown to Africa eight times right so within a span of like two or three years I became unrecognizable to people that had known me and I became unrecognizable to myself. And that's what I'm talking about as an asset, that you're, you're, you're expanding your skills, your capabilities, your, your footprint, really. Um, and I kind of want to end on this note. You really have a choice. You can be an asset or you can be a liability, okay? Um, you can be someone that causes problems to people. You can be someone that has like a terrible attitude that rubs off negatively on others. You can be the person that's always needing help, dependent, you know, unable to do like things like to further yourself. You can be that problem person in your family. You can be a liability if that's what you're going for, but you have the option to be an asset. And I would really encourage you to be an asset if, if at all possible. Um, when I think about us as church members and the different view that we have, there's 16 million church members to 7 billion people on the earth. That means each of us, if we're really carrying our own load, is meant to be a light to 437 other people on the earth that aren't church members, by the way, right? So I'm not talking about like being great in your ward of a couple hundred people and like your family and a couple hundred Facebook friends. I'm talking like get out of that and get into the world as a humanitarian, as a business person, be an asset. You know, I think about like the impact of light when there's a dark room and you turn on the light, the whole room gets lit up. Okay, if you have a match, like Smokey the Bear, right? Don't start forest fires. Like one tiny match can burn down thousands of acres of forest, right? Like it has such an impact. 
And yet on the same time, like a virus, right? Also, like you think about Zika or Ebola or all these other things, like it starts with like one person and then it spreads rapidly in a negative and destructive way. So when I tell you, you have the opportunity to be an asset or you have the opportunity to be a liability, I truly feel that especially having the opportunity to be here at BYUY, be in the gospel, be secure, you know, in the ways that you have opportunities, we have the opportunity to be, to be a continuous perpetual asset. I hope that while I'm here at BYU Hawaii with you today and throughout the upcoming months, you know, I'm here on Wednesdays with Anactus, I hope that I can be an asset to you. You're welcome to reach out to me at any time if I can help you with anything like the things I've talked about today or in any other way. And I guess it's time for questions. Yes. Yeah. Make them really hard questions. Carolyn, I've got one. Oh. So, let's speak from the back. But can you explain the difference between an angel investor? Like, if you can't get a VC fund, sure. where would they go? Um, yeah, so an angel investor typically invest, is a private individual that has money of their own. Um, that invest in the stocks, they invest in private companies, et cetera. But the amount of money that they typically invest is under a million. And usually it's in chunks of 25,000 up to maybe a couple hundred thousand. And typically angels invest as a group. So you'll have like maybe four or 10 angels that come together that each put $25,000 in to raise you know, $200,000 or something, or maybe they each put 50,000 in to raise you know, 300,000. Um, and the only difference, okay, and then a venture firm is a professional investing firm, right? So it may or may not be people that have their own money that are investing other institutions' money, so like an endowment, a pension fund, uh, another investment fund, uh, a family foundation, a family wealth office. They're professional managers of money that invest other people's funds at the, starting at a level of a million going up to maybe 50 million or 100 million, right? And um, so they're, they're kind of later in the game and angels come in earlier. So it's not always a trade-off of like, should I take angel or VC? It's more like, what stage of funding is my business appropriate for right now? If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah. So I hear two things there, and I've heard that question so many times from great entrepreneurs. And the first thing to ask is like, am I willing and interested to give up control of my venture? Um, because if I'm not willing and able to give up control partially, right, I'm not like jumping out of the van and letting someone else drive completely, but like, am I willing to share the wheel? If you're not willing to share the wheel, do not take angel or venture for money, because it will only end badly for you. Okay, because these are professionals that have been investing money in this way for many years, and there are tons of legal ways to get you out of the business if you're not cooperating with you know, what's great for the business. So that's the first thing I'd say, like, ask yourself, am I ready to share, share the wheel? Okay, secondly from that, I, I really mentioned that financial benchmark as an indicator. If your company hasn't already generated 300,000 of revenue, maybe it was 30,000 a year for 10 years, whatever, it doesn't matter how long it took you. If your company hasn't generated that amount of revenues, do not approach a venture fund asking for an investment. Approach them to build a relationship, that's fine. Approach them to get advice. Approach them to set up a conversation for a year from now, right? But if your revenues are below that level, then you really need to focus on customers, right? Because what a venture fund does, what an angel investor does, is they accelerate an existing business that's already in motion. They're not really there for uh, pure startup capital at the very, very beginning. So, yeah. Yeah. With with venture firms, or what I was referring to is. So I worked in the venture scene in Seattle, and Portland, and Salt Lake and Southeast Idaho, like kind of that Northwest corner. And there are great firms that have really professional people there and that can only benefit you. And I benefited from some of the firms that I was affiliated with. 
But some of the other firms that I was affiliated with, I mean, you're working in an industry where there's a lot of greed, there's a lot of power dynamics, there's a lot of achievement that maybe they have the same values as us in some ways as church members, but maybe they don't. And I'm not saying like they need to go to Sunday school to share values, but I'm talking about like treating people appropriately or having appropriate male female boundaries in the workplace right or like I, I remember specifically i remember one summer working in portland working with startups working with investments and i just kind of looked around and saw like most of my colleagues most of my colleagues in the space had drug problems like had affairs going on in their marriages like had, had like divorces going on Right, so I looked around at that and I was like, wow, in this industry, one should be careful. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your business 10X, is that right? Sure. Can you explain what that is? Like, I, I couldn't find it, I was trying to find yeah. it. Yeah. Can you explain what that is, what you do? Yeah, yeah, so basically, so I worked for venture firms for a while, and then the financial meltdown of 2008 happened, which, um, Actually, it was kind of funny. I was speaking, uh, not speaking, I was moderating a panel for an angel investment group in Seattle that day, like when the stock market collapsed in, I think it was October 2008. Like everything went downhill. So a lot of angels lost like half their money, right? So they immediately were like, whoa, we're not going to invest. And then when angels stop investing, then venture firms stop investing. And the whole chain like seizes up. And then on the like consumer side, like people's mortgages were affected, like people's jobs were affected, like all these things happened. So I was probably the only one in the US that day that was like, man, this is gonna be, this is, what a great day. This is gonna be great for my panel tonight. Apart from that and all the like fallout, um, I was like, wow. Um, I continued working with a venture firm and we just, like we would meet with like 100 entrepreneurs a month and like do zero investments. And it just continued like that for months. And I thought with the skills that I have from working in this venture fund, like there's probably a better way to affect this economic situation. And I think it's gonna be working with the CEOs and the entrepreneurs hand in hand to get these customer like sales going, to get these business models up and going so that like people can have jobs again and people can like support their family. So I left the firm and I started 10X. It was called something different at the time that I started it. And really my goal was to help entrepreneurs from wherever they were get to a million in new revenue within 18 months. Um, it started out as a regional um, like project, really, and then it grew into a accelerator that has been continuously running for 10 years, and that um, typically we work with around 50 startups a year. Um, I kind of took a hiatus when I went to grad school the last two years, but um, typically work with teams at all different stages of revenue. Some are at zero, some are at 400,000, some are, some are over a million, but they're retooling or they need to kind of go in a different direction. And we just try to clear a path to get them to a significantly increased capacity for the business. Yeah. I started it in Portland and now I've lived in like five other states. So it's sort of, yeah. Still working with that, yeah. 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 Oh, the name 10X came from the venture industry, I forgot to say that, because venture investors look for a 10X return on their investment. So, yeah. Okay, any other hard, hard questions? Was my exit strategy? Um, I'm really glad you mentioned that because there was something I was going to show you guys and I totally forgot about it. I made a spreadsheet for myself like six years ago called my annual giving allocation spreadsheet. And I was like six or seven taps on it and I would be happy to email it to anybody that wants it. Um, but basically I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, what am I doing? You know, like you just get to that point at certain times and I was like, doing and then I was like let me like reverse engineer this like what am I going to live to like 75 maybe 80 like everyone in my family was like 80 90 you know okay I can bank on 75 for sure so then I've got what like 40 more years I don't know how many more years I have I have some years left it's so, like what do I want on my headstone at that time like what do I want people saying at my funeral right so let me start with that 
So for me, um, like a priority is the Nobel Peace Prize. I know it's ridiculous, I get that, but like that's what I want. I want the Nobel Peace Prize for strengthening vulnerable families and children. Like that's my priority, which might sound weird given like all this experience I have in business, right? But it's not because if you think about like how my life started, having to strengthen my own family and my own siblings, right? Like other people are having to do that, but maybe don't have the drive that I had or don't have the access to the skills or the organizations or the mentors, whatever. So like for me, that's a priority is the Nobel Peace Prize. So then I back up from that and I'm like, okay, so 30 years from now, I'm going to be flying to Stockholm. What's going to get me there? Okay. So what's my like five year chunk from now until the next five years piece of that? Right. So then I make commitments to different organizations and different initiatives and different work commitments and different uses of my time that align with what that goal is. So like in the past, maybe I worked with Big Brothers, Big Sisters as a mentor. Currently, I'm working with Foundation Africa that um, supports orphanages and has around 6,000 children um, within their programs. That project I've been on for the last four years, so I'm actually about ready to let go of that one and jump onto a bigger one that hopefully will have a reach of like maybe 25 to 100,000 families and individuals. So that's kind of an application like, that's, I mean, we all have the same exit strategy. We're gonna pass away and we have to report to Heavenly Father. What did I do with my life, right? So in my life, I wanna be operating at a capacity every year that's bigger than it was the year before. For me personally, towards that goal of reducing suffering for vulnerable families and children, you know? Uh, so I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's what I'm going for. Okay, good? All right, thank you guys. Yeah.